In this experiment, I'm going to be synthesizing a type of molecule called an azo dye. This is literally a dye, like what we would use to color fabrics. This reaction is a two-step process. It starts with uh, a diazotization process, which is where I am going to be converting aniline into a diazonium compound. This is done using hydrochloric acid and sodium nitrite, NaNO2, not NO3. And this process just converts the aniline NH2 group into the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond with a positive charge. There are a lot of different types of molecules that you could use for this diazotization. You can start with aniline or you could start with some substituted version of aniline. So something that would maybe have a nitro group on there, there's a lot of different options. The only real requirement is that there is the NH2 group. So once I get the um, diazonium salt synthesized, I'm then going to perform step two, which is going to be an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. I'm going to take the diazonium and I'm going to react it with an alcohol, an aromatic alcohol, uh, or another version of aniline. So I could be using um, another NH2 here instead. What really matters the most is that I have a lone pair of electrons on the atom that's attached directly to the aromatic ring. And again, I don't have to use just plain phenol here. I could use um, some sort of substituted version of phenol. There's a lot of different options of what I could use in this step. This is, like I said, this step is called is, is an electrophilic aromatic substitution with the diazonium acting as the electrophile. So this is going to be adding to the, this particular ring over here. This OH group is an orthopara director, or if we had an NH2 group, that would also be an orthopara director. So when we combine these two molecules together, we're going to get either ortho substitution or para substitution. And notice that we don't really make any changes at all to the alcohol that we're using, the aromatic alcohol, aside from just adding that um, diazonium compound to it. This is a really simple version of the product of this reaction because keep in mind, we could have all kinds of other substituents on these rings. That's gonna give us a lot of variety in the final color of the, the particular dye. This step, even though it is an electrophilic aromatic substitution step, this is technically referred to as a coupling step because it couples these two molecules together. I'm actually going to synthesize this azo dye in two different ways. One method, I'm just going to be combining all of these molecules directly together and I'll be synthesizing the dye. It's going to come out as a solid uh, powder compound. The other method that I'm going to use to synthesize the dye is called the ingrain process. In this process, I'm going to be synthesizing the dye on a piece of fabric. So first I'm going to synthesize this, comp this compound right here, and then I'm going to soak a piece of fabric with this particular compound so that it's embedded in the fabric. And then to that fabric, I'm going to add the second compound. The coupling is going to take place on the surface of the fabric, so the fabric will be dyed as the molecule is being synthesized, which is really cool to watch. I hope you enjoy it. For my di diazo component, I'm gonna be using aniline. I want about 10 millimoles for aniline. That's gonna be about 0.93 grams. It's a liquid, so I'm gonna be putting it straight into that 150 milliliter beaker. It's a little bit too much, but that's okay. We've got 1.218 grams. Next, I need to dilute some six molar hydrochloric acid, and I'll do that using water. The instructions ask for eight milliliters of three molar hydrochloric acid, and I only had six. So I'm going to make a 50-50 mixture of water with hydrochloric acid to cut that concentration in half. Four milliliters of water, and four milliliters of six molar HCl gives me a total of eight milliliters and a concentration of three molar. And I'll just be pouring this mixture directly into the aniline. The next ingredient that I'll be adding is the sodium nitrite. Addition of sodium nitrite generates a lot of heat. And I'm gonna preempt that by cooling this solution down to five degrees Celsius before I add any of the sodium nitrite. So the next thing that I'm going to do here is just submerge this in an ice bath. 
monitor the temperature and wait until that aniline hydrochloric acid mixture gets down to five degrees Celsius before I begin adding the sodium nitrite mixture solution. It's kind of difficult to monitor the temperature of a solution that has a really, really small volume. So while this um, cools itself down, I'm going to go ahead and measure out the coupling component so that it is ready when we come to that step. For my coupling component, I'm gonna be using resorcinol. I need 10 millimoles of resorcinol and that's gonna be about 1.1 grams. Point zero 0.05. Let's check the temperature of this um, aniline hydrochloric acid solution. Remember that we want to get this temperature down below 5 degrees Celsius before we move on to the next step of the reaction. It looks like we're good. The next step is to add the sodium nitrite. The instructions call for um, 10 milliliters of one molar sodium nitrite and I only have 0.5 molar sodium nitrite so I've doubled the volume to make sure that I get enough moles. So I'm adding 20 milliliters of 0.5 molar. Now the instructions say that I need to keep the temperature below 10 degrees Celsius during this process um, to only add a little bit of sodium nitrite as, at a time and monitor the temperature after each addition. It looks like I've already messed up. Um, the temperature is supposed to be staying below 10 degrees and I'm already exceeding that. So what I'm gonna do is just let this cool itself back down to below 10 degrees before I add any more. And then maybe next time, don't add quite so much. I'm done adding all of the sodium nitrite and I'm just gonna do a quick starch iodide test here to make sure that I've added enough. A blue black color lets me know that I've added a sufficient amount of sodium nitrite and I can move on to the next step of the reaction. If this wasn't blue, I would just add a little bit more until I did get a positive test. The last thing that I'm gonna do is separate this into two separate beakers, which I've labeled D1 and D2. The D is for diazo compound. If you remember from the introduction, I'm going to be synthesizing this azo dye in two different methods. And so what I'm doing here is just dividing this, this in half um, for each of the two methods that I'm going to be using to synthesize the dye. This isn't an exact division here, I'm just kind of eyeballing, trying to get the same volume in each. And I'm going to keep these solutions in this ice bath until I'm ready to use them just so that they stay nice and fresh. Here is my resorcinol that I've already weighed out. This is what I'm using for the coupling component. I'm gonna be dissolving it in some sodium hydroxide. The instructions ask for 40 milliliters of one molar sodium hydroxide. I didn't have one molar sodium hydroxide, so I used some water to dilute that six molar solution. And all that we have to do here is just wait for the resorcinol to dissolve in this sodium hydroxide solution. I am gonna be keeping it on ice during this process so that it stays nice and cold. My resorcinol has dissolved in the sodium hydroxide and look, it's this cool green color. Next, I'm gonna divide it into two portions uh, in beakers labeled C1 and C2. The C is for coupling component. This is exactly the same as what I did with the diazo component in the beakers D1 and D2. So I'm just eyeballing the volumes here, trying to get them pretty much the same. The C1 beaker, I'm gonna put back on ice. I'm gonna use that later. And I'm gonna work on the, the C2 solution. This, I'm gonna add some water to it. So I'm just gonna get it even more diluted. This is 40 milliliters of water that has been chilled. And mix this up a little bit. And then I'm gonna be adding the cloth into this C2 solution and just letting that C2 solution soak into the cloth. So I wanna get it like really saturated in there.
So I'm going to put it on ice and I'm going to let it sit in this um, ice water bath for a while so that I can get a real good saturation in that cloth. This has been soaking for about five minutes, so I'm gonna pull it out. Notice that the cloth is still white, even though the solution is green. And I'm gonna hang this up and let it dry completely. And while it's drying, I'm gonna work on the other part of this experiment, which is the direct synthesis of the azo dye. Here's the other half of the coupling component that I haven't used yet, C1. And I'm gonna be mixing that with solution D1, which is just one of the portions of the diazo component. I'm gonna be doing this direct reaction directly inside this beaker labeled C1. This is gonna be the process that synthesizes the azo dye directly in the beaker. So we mix these two solutions together. This is gonna be our first look at the color of the azo dye that I'm synthesizing in this reaction. The azo dye that's being synthesized is not soluble in water. It is beginning to precipitate out of the solution, but it's a really, really fine powder and it's very difficult to see because of the just the dark color of the solution in general. So I'm adding some ice to help solidify the azo dye. And after it's been sitting in ice for a few minutes, I am going to filter it uh, to collect the, the solid azo dye. So as I mentioned, the azo dye is, is a really fine powder and that makes it pretty difficult to filter via vacuum. The small particles kind of clog up the filter paper, like not literally, but they just make it a lot harder for the solvent, the water to pass through the filter paper. This is gonna have to sit on vacuum for quite a bit longer than normal. There's just, it's just a pretty slow vacuuming process. What I'm doing here is just kind of pushing down the vacuum to make sure that I have a really good seal, which helps speed up the process. But in general, we just have to be patient uh, and wait for all of that water to get sucked through the filter paper. The cloth is totally dry now and it's ready for the diazo component. I'm gonna begin by diluting the diazo component in a little bit of water just to increase the volume and make it easier to soak the cloth. Remember the cloth has been completely saturated with the coupling component. The coupling component is embedded in the fibers of the cloth. So when I add the cloth to the diazo component, the coupling reaction is going to take place in the fibers of the cloth. The azo dye will be synthesized directly in the cloth. It's gonna happen real fast, so watch closely. Here's the dye that we synthesized. It's like curled up the filter paper in there. I'm gonna get a mass on it that I've got to separate it from this filter paper. Notice that it's like completely dyed the filter paper also. Um, and it's, it's just like really solid, but also as I'm taking it off the filter paper, it's really flaky. And I'm trying to not get it everywhere because it is a dye. This 
this. Uh, we got 0.581 grams. Here's a picture of my cloth, and as you can see, my dye turned out to be a really deep red color. And here are some pictures of cloths that have been dyed by students who have taken this class in previous years. The color of the dye that's synthesized in this experiment depends on which compound you choose as your diazo component and which compound you choose to be your coupling component. So there are a lot of different options. One of the fun things about this experiment is just getting to see what color your dye turns out to be.